Hey YouTube, what's up? Welcome back to another video in the series where I start my own tech company. Recently, I've been working on building a game in Phaser.js, which is part of that tech company. I go into that in some previous videos if you wanna catch up. But this week, I was focused on adding enemies to that game. Let's take a look. So here we have my game. And you can see in the bottom corner, there's this little log enemy that's walking around in a random pattern. Uh, I have my hearts still in the upper left hand corner. That was what I was working on last week. And this enemy is walking around. If my hero encounters this enemy or they overlap, that enemy will attack my hero. You will see the hero have a brief animation that he's taking damage where he will basically flicker back and forth. And then the hearts UI in the top left corner will take one heart away. So you could see that briefly there when the log overlapped with my hero. My hero uh, flickered a bit. You could see it there one more time. So now I've lost two, not lives, but I guess two hearts from my health. And if I were to lose my last heart, you can see that the screen fades to black and that will be where we have our game over scenario. That was a lot of fun to work on this week, but it was also very complicated and there were a lot of code changes. So let's jump right into it. So here we are in my preloader. This is what loads everything before the game scene actually starts. And here on line 15, after I created the pack of my enemy character, which is all the frames that our animations are gonna use, I, co I covered how to do this in a previous video where we were creating character animations, but I'm using tiled uh, to place the enemy. Actually, I will be using tiled, but I'm not using tiled yet. I'm using texture packer to create the uh, atlas or the JSON and the packed image where our JSON is like pulling those images from. So here on line 15, I'm loading that atlas under the key of enemy. Uh, last week, we loaded the images on lines 18 and 19. Those were for our game UI, and this week we are using the empty hearts as well as the full hearts. Moving on, in our test scene, which is the game scene we just looked at, I did a lot of refactoring this week to try to clean up this test scene because as I'm adding more and more features to the game, they all exist on this test scene, but it's time to start abstracting some of that work into other files just to keep this uh, cleaner. We did add health and max health last week to our hero sprite object. This week we've added a take damage function, which I'll come back to in a bit, but that's here on line 50. And the next thing to go over is our enemy sprites. So in order to add an enemy and have him attack the character, the first thing that we needed to do was to add the enemy to the scene. So we're doing that by creating a group of enemy sprites here on line 71, because I know that we're going to have more than one enemy in future versions of this game. And then on line 72, we're creating a specific enemy sprite. We're playing that idle animation on line 78 as soon as we finished creating the enemy sprite. We're setting an is attacking property to false. We have a very similar property on our hero sprite as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we were recreating that here. And then we're adding that enemy sprite to our array, our group of enemy sprites. I've talked previously how I'm using the grid engine plugin for phaser.js to control the movement of my characters and boundaries and stuff like that. Hopefully it's gonna make the process of building this game a little bit easier because they have some utility functions. So. Here on lines 159, we have our grid engine config. And in order to have our enemy show up on the screen, we need to add that enemy to this config. So we're just doing so directly on lines 167 through 172. And then on line 177, we're moving that enemy randomly by passing in the enemy key and some values to the move randomly function that exists on the grid engine object. This is only possible to be called after it's created on line 176. We're also adding an overlap between our hero sprite and all of our enemy sprites on line 179. The first thing we need to do in that function is figure out which of those things is our enemy. And then we're gonna do some logic in that overlap based on 
some properties on the enemy object. So if the enemy is attacking or actively moving, we don't need to do anything. But if he is not attacking or if he's not moving, then we do want to attack. So we will play the enemy attacking animation. We will have our hero sprite take damage and then we will set the enemy is attacking to true. And then after two seconds, we will set is attacking to false. And this is basically going to prevent our enemy from constantly attacking our hero. And we would go from three health to zero too quickly. And I can also imagine a future version of this game where we pass in different values to this delayed call that will affect how quickly, that's basically the attack speed of our enemies. So we can jump back up to this take damage function here because this was the other main uh, work that we did this week. Before we do though, um, I do want to touch base on line 200, which was the only other uh, work we had to do to get our enemy working properly. At this point, without line 200, your enemy will move around your game and can interact with your hero, but the animations won't be playing properly. So. Um, in our subscription function on our grid engine, we wanna make sure that we're filtering by character ID. This is something I added this week. And then if it's a hero, which is the key for our, our main character, we will play our regular hero animation. But if it's an enemy, we wanna make sure we're playing our enemy sprites, our animations that exist on our enemy sprite. Um, and again, this is something that as you add more different types of enemies to your game, you will need to handle all of the cases for each of those enemies. And then we also need to listen to the movement stopped and the direction changed and do the same thing. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. So let's jump into the hero sprite take damage function that was much uh, earlier up in this file. So that's here on line 50. I'm going to open that up. And uh, this isn't a ton of work, but so when the hero takes damage, we want to take in that damage uh, as a, a property on this function and that's because different enemies in the future will probably do different amounts of damage so we have a, a delayed call of 180 seconds here i'm sorry this would be 18 milliseconds because uh, i think 1000 is one second um, so i have some leftover console logs from the work i was doing just to try to troubleshoot but we can see here on line 53 we want our health to be our health minus the damage that comes in from the enemy and then we're going to event, uh, I'm sorry, emit an event on our scene events object. That's something I also created this week. Last week, we created this game UI scene that's going to exist on top of our game, our test scene. And that's because we want our UI to exist in every scene and we don't want to duplicate that code inside of every scene. But in order to communicate between scenes, our game scene and our UI scene, we need to use the uh, event emitter that's built into phaser and this scene events is just sort of a wrapper built around that I can show that in a second but basically that is what's going to communicate to our game UI and say hey our hero is taking damage or our player health has changed the same if em event will emit when you pick up a, a heart container or something like that that will increase your heart as well so if the hero sprite's health is great, uh, less than or equal to zero, we're gonna fade out the camera. And then this is where we would initiate our game over scene. Otherwise, this.tweens.add, uh, a tween is something that's used in game development to show a sort of temporary animation on an object. So this is what's creating this uh, fading in and out property that's happening when the character gets hit. Um, okay, so let's jump into our game UI file. I mentioned that we're using an event emitter to handle the changes in UI. Last week we talked about creating that hearts UI, that code is here, is here on lines 21 through 29. And everything with this green bar is what we added this week. I should say that I used a tutorial that's from Arcade uh, and Super Tommy, he's the guy who made it, which was incredibly helpful. And I'm gonna try to leave that link in the description if anyone else wants to watch that for reference. 
But basically what we're doing is listening to the um, player health changed event. And when that happens, we're gonna call a function that exists on this scene. And that's the handle player health changed function. And then we also need to pass in the context of this scene to that function. On lines 37 through 44, we're basically cleaning up that um, event listener with the same logic. So jumping into our handle player health changed function, that's gonna take in the health, which is the updated health of our character. And then we're going to sort of map over our hearts object, which we moved from being created inside of our create method. It was a const before, a variable local to our create function. But we moved that to exist on the scene object itself. Here on line four, we're saying private hearts. And this exclamation mark tells TypeScript to, to trust me. I know it's gonna be there. And then that is a type of a phaser game objects group. So we're mapping over that hearts object that now exists on the scene inside of this function that also exists on the scene. And for each of those hearts inside of that game object, we have access to the game object itself or the heart itself, maybe that's what this should be called, and the index of that heart. So we're relabeling each of those game objects inside of that for each function and saying our heart variable is equal to the game object and we're casting that as a type of game objects dot image. And the reason we're doing that is because the set texture function here on lines 50 and 52 do not exist on the game object class, but they do exist on the image class. So if our index is less than our health that we're passing in the new health, the texture should be a full heart. But if it is equal to our health or greater than our health, and we need to do a um, strictly less than check here instead of a less than or equal to check because the um, hearts index that's in an array, so that's gonna be zero, one, two, three in this case, or zero, one, two will be the indexes of each item in that array. Whereas the health, um, if it's max, it's gonna be three out of three. And then as we decrement that, as we take damage, it will be three, two, one, and a zero would be a game over. We don't really update the UI again after it goes below zero. Um, so that's the reason we need to do that. And basically we're gonna set the texture as a UI heart full when there is uh, still health there. And we're setting the texture as empty once the character takes damage and we only have two out of three hearts, for example. Um, I did say that we were going to look at the scene events class, so uh, let me see if I can open that really quickly. Um, doesn't look like it's easy. Um, okay, you can see my code base here. Um, let's try to find that scene events class. I believe there's an events folder at the top level. So it should be here in our event center. So we've created an events center object. And in there, we're creating a constant called scene events and that is just a class of a phaser event emitter. Pretty simple, straightforward file, nothing special, but that's what we're using to communicate between different scenes. So let's go take a look at the, uh, the result one more time. If I refresh this page, you should be able to see that uh, sleeping animation that happens when our enemy is idling very briefly before he starts moving. And you can see it there in the bottom right hand corner. So now our enemy is moving around and we can take damage and you can see that brief uh, attack animation from our log enemy Oop, happened again. And now it's game over. And you can tell I can move my character a bit there briefly um, after he took damage. That's something else that we'll need to clean up in the future weeks. So there's a lot of work still left to be done, but I'm very excited because this was a, a major uh, step to get through in our process to get to an MVP version of this uh, game, which is part of the, the business that I'm trying to build. So thanks for watching as I figure this stuff out week by week, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.